Hello, um, good afternoon and sorry for the little delay there. We had some technical difficulties, but we're, we're ready to roll now with our program. Um, so good afternoon. Um, this is the, we welcome you to the North Carolina Library for the Blind and Physically Handicapped uh, program, Histories Mysteries. This is the third in a three-part series that library patron Bill Steppen has been presenting for us this year. I'm Catherine Rubin, the Assistant Regional Librarian. Both the nation and the state have proclaimed uh, November Native American Heritage Month. And in keeping with that, Bill will be talking about Native Americans before the Europeans. First, a few housekeeping matters. Please note that this program will be recorded in video and audio. After hearing Bill's presentation on this intriguing topic, it's, uh, it's likely that you'll want to find out more about America before the Europeans. For further information, a resource list of North Carolina Library for the Blind, and uh, there are our audio resources and online resources available through the State Library is posted online. If you are a National Library Service patron and want the list in an alternative format, please contact us. Bill will be presenting PowerPoint slides, but he will also describe them for the audience. You will be muted when the program starts, so we won't get background noises. You will, there will be a time for questions at the end of the program, and there are several ways to ask a question. You can raise your hand physically if your video is on. You can select the Zoom raise hand option or you can type a question, a question in the chat box at any time by clicking the chat option in the bottom middle of the Zoom screen. Staff will be monitoring those questions. If you're calling by an old fashioned landline phone, not a smartphone loaded with Zoom, use star six to mute or unmute yourself. Use star nine to raise your hand to ask a question. So now I'm gonna um, introduce our speaker, Bill Steppen. For more than 50 years, our speaker, Bill Steppen, has been a history teacher, writer, educational consultant, and so storyteller. He taught history in middle and high schools in both Illinois and North Carolina. While teaching, Bill was an author for a K through seven social studies series and a popular Illinois state history book. As founder of Human Learning Resources Incorporated, Bill trained teachers across the US in ways to help their students develop critical thinking skills. For the past three years, Mr. Steppen has been blending a storytelling style with history topics through a program titled History's Mysteries to help history come alive again for adult audiences. Bill is not a stranger to the North Carolina Library for the Blind and Physically Handicapped. He's been a patron for more than 10 years, often using the library to research topics for his presentations. So thank you, Bill, for being here and we're ready to start. Well, thank you, Catherine, I appreciate that. And thanks to everybody who popped in today. Um, the uh, weather outside is beautiful. I. We're gonna walk with these people that you see in your screen. Okay. <clears throat> Pardon me, I'm, I'm getting some notes on my screen. I had to wipe off, but I'm sorry. So we're gonna take a little walk with these people that you see on, on your screen in this beautiful drawing. And we're going to uh, enter the Americas a long, long time ago, certainly a long time before Europeans ever uh, arrived. And it was fascinating as a teacher for, uh, for all those years, when you looked at curriculum guides as to what you were expected to cover in your course, what kids were expected to learn, um, you always found that the, the, the front matter, the first years, the story of the first people, of the indigenous people, of Native Americans, there weren't a lot of pages in the curriculum guide. There, in fact, weren't always a lot of pages in the textbooks either. It was sort of like, well, they're not really full of stuff that we need to learn about. And so uh, it's, been, it's been such a delight over the last uh, number of years now to see that emphasis beginning to even out quite a bit. So we're gonna do a little more of that today with our, with our program. 
And like I say, we're going to start with a walk. And I've got, hope you've got your boots on, you've got some comfortable clothing, uh, because we're going to push on. And some of the territory we're going to be walking across is going to be pretty rough stuff. So let's get started. Well, uh, there we are, hiding behind that bush, getting ready to maybe try to secure a little meal. Uh, but before we start uh, confronting this critter over here to our right uh, in that picture, let's think about four questions or issues that we might want to talk about today and, and, and feature. First of all, uh, before Europeans arrived, did first people hunt and gather everything they needed? Is that what their life was all about? Chasing animals? grabbing plants, and that was uh, pretty much their life. Did those first people have any control over nature? Or were they pretty much at the, at the whim of whatever confronted them uh, uh, from uh, natural circumstances? Did the first people build any cities as big as European cities? We're gonna take a little time to, to take a look at that question. And then lastly, did, um, did the first uh, people have immunities and, uh, or did they get sick like everybody else got sick? So we're gonna take a look at those four questions and I promise that I will spell a little better than I did in, in, in question number four there, um, but we will do it by going back to the beginning of our continents. And that will have to take us back to probably almost 100,000 years ago. Now that means that uh, when America, oh, when first people were about to enter the Americas, they didn't have a map. They didn't have any warning that there would be new land uh, to, uh, uh, to investigate. But over the period of about a um, hundred thousand years ago, a glacier age began again, especially in the Northern Hemisphere. Most of the Northern Hemisphere, after a period of a, of a number of years, would be covered by glaciers. Some of those glaciers would be a mile thick. And the effect of that would be that the sea levels around our planet would begin to get lower and lower. Well, why is that? Well, here's what was happening. The water from the oceans would evaporate as it normally does. It would then condense in the form of rain or condense in the form of snow. And that would uh, come down upon the glaciers. Now, because of the extreme cold and the glacier surfaces, that uh, uh, water would freeze and stay with the glacier. And for a long, long uh, period of time, none of that glacier melted. So none of the water ran back into the ocean. So as the ocean is going down from evaporation, especially, okay, the glaciers are building. And what's happening in, in the oceans area is that land is beginning to surface or become visible, become accessible because the sea level is dropping down to the level of the land underneath the, uh, the, the sea surface in many areas. Especially true on this map that's on our left-hand side. We have up at the upper edge of the map, we have Asia indicated. We have then North America in the middle of the screen and South America on the lower right. And we have the number 14,000 miles on the map. Well, as the uh, ocean levels dropped. The piece of land that is under the Bering Sea right now today became, uh, uh, became the land surface in that area between Asia and Alaska. It was called Berlingia, the Berlingia Land Bridge, that name being given to it in, in, in the last century. Okay, now that land bridge became available, visible, usable after the 
uh, sea levels had dropped about 350 feet. So that's quite a significant water uh, 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 loss in the oceans. Where was that water? It was now in the form of glacier ice. It would come back to the oceans uh, uh, about 90,000 years after the glaciers began as it would come back to the ocean as a runoff, as rain, as a number of other things. Now, over the last number of years, DNA sampling, carbon dating, and satellite imaging, along with the luminescence testing, have all given us evidence of, of, of something going on along the, 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 the shoreline and through the midst of these continents that we are collaborating by artifacts. The artifacts tell the story, okay? So if we look at the map and we go way in the upper left-hand corner where Asia is at, we see Berlingia is written on the map. That's the land bridge that becomes usable between Asia and North America during that glacial age. This is a land map that people can walk across. And the people in Asia that are hunters and gatherers and wanderers will start out to cross that land bridge. Now, as I said, artifacts tell the tale. And here's an interesting story. If you see on the map, there are actually uh, a, a number of lines in red. They indicate the pathways likely to have been taken by the first people as they walked down from Asia, across Alaska, Canada, into North America, and so forth south, all the way down to the far southern tip of South America, down there at the bottom of your screen. That's a journey of 14,000 miles. And as we're gonna find, artifacts tell us a very, very interesting tale, because what they are telling us, as we'll see in a moment, is that it would have been virtually impossible for people to have walked from Canada and from Alaska down to the tip of South America in the number of years that we know first people were here on this continent. That's a 14,000 mile trip. Well, how else could they have made the trip? Well, within the last couple of decades, Scientists have, have become infatuated with evidence that indicates there might have been another mode of transportation. And right now, you're going to find the consensus amongst historians and archaeologists is, you know what? It probably meant that people used boats along the coastline of North America, Central America, and South America to get all the way down to Peru and Chile and all of that uh, territory in the far south of South America in such a fast time. So let's take a look and see what, what, what that looks like as we follow it a little more closely. Well, there on the right, you can see uh, our trip has been interrupted for a minute while we pull in to get a little bit of lunch. Um, the question right, right here is, what was life like? Let's consider that first for those wanderers and hunters and gatherers that first crossed the Berlingia landmass from Asia to Alaska. What was life like for them? What kind of people were they? Well, they followed animals, we know that. They uh, took pathways between glaciers. And as the glaciers left, they followed the receding glaciers over the years. Uh, following uh, in the footsteps of those glaciers, crossing the grasslands that became uh, available, uh, crossing the steppe kind of geography that became available, and they also followed shorelines moving along. Now, there was no plan. These first people did not have a plan that said, look, we're going to be in Baja, California by Tuesday. We'll be in Mexico City by Thursday. You know, that was not anywhere, as you, you, you would imagine, as a part of their, uh, uh, their thinking. They were following their food sources. They were looking for what seemed interesting in front of them. They were moving ahead. Okay? 
And as long as life could be sustained, they could move on and on and on. Eventually, between the time that the Berlingia land bridge became available and then disappeared under the ocean again, when the glaciers uh, melted, okay, we suspect that only a few thousand of these first people actually crossed the land bridge. Okay, now uh, we're focusing on the, on the uh, uh, people entering the America, but don't forget this glacier age also uh, encompassed, encompassed the whole Northern half of, of, of Europe and Asia uh, in that territory. So Europe, had to also be resettled during the same period of time, all because of that, that glacial age. Okay, so what about, I'm going to, uh, okay. the, um, the heading we have up here is that those first people were always hunting and gathering. That's what their life was about. And without being able to hunt for food and gather something that could uh, was subsistence for them, they would disappear. They couldn't do anything about it. But that began to change as the first people wandered onto the pathways across Canada, North America, into Central America, and down into South America. One of the things that is amazing is how much these people were experimenters. They moved ahead as they could find food sources and the food sources changed. Not only did the animals change uh, from place to place, but so did the plant life. And so they experimented not only with, with what kind of animals to, to capture, or, or uh, uh, kill for food, but they experimented on what could be eaten from the landscape. And about 7,000 years ago, we have pretty good evidence that the first people were beginning to stay more and more in a place here, there, and over there, scattered about. And in those places where they were settling, or staying, it was because they had discovered that maize or corn could be grown, was edible, was tasty, and would help sustain life. And with maize also came squash and beans. Now these things were not crops that the first people went into a garden shop somewhere and bought. They were things that they found through experimentation, could be captured as seeds from existing plants in the environment. They could be planted. They would grow a crop that they desired to eat. The combination of maize, squash, and beans became known in the Americas as the Three Sisters. Very often, where you found one, you found the others. You can see that in the picture. The picture shows us a picture uh, taken today of something called Milpa. Milpa is a system of agriculture in Central and South America being practiced more and more because of uh, its uh, ecological uh, friendliness. It is a combination of these three plants, the maize, the squash, and the beans being grown together you can see the beans and the squash down lower. You can see the beautiful corn plant uh, sticking up because together they cooperate in, in their growth processes, in the care of the soil underneath them. And it was the first people who finally began to put these crops together, these plants together, and found that if they could grow this in a place, they could grow it a second year if they saved the seeds. And then they could grow it again after that. And those wandering people didn't have to do the wandering that had brought them across the land bridge. So along with three sisters, 
our, our uh, first people to the New World also discovered uh, tomatoes, potatoes, and a number of other plants that could be uh, grown successfully, that they could be grown yearly and controlled in some way. They also found how to use some textiles. Now, one of the textiles is a plant and that's cotton. And we'll see how cotton was grown just a little bit later in the program when we go down to the Peruvian coast. But we can't forget also that first people uh, discovered how to grow the textile wool. But of course that would be on an animal and not on a, on a plant. So let's follow along with first people a little bit further. Well, uh, scientists have, have kind of labeled corn as miracle maize. Uh, about uh, 9,000 years ago, the, the teosinte grass, which, is a, which was a native plant uh, in uh, Central America, was looked at very closely by, by uh, uh, first people and noticing that the grass, uh, some forms of the grass grew big enough so that the fruit of that grass could be actually tasted. And pretty soon, the first people, about from 7,000 years ago on, uh, began to break away certain forms of the teosinte grass, that which produced a, a large enough fruit as well as seed so that the plant could be eaten. And then, uh, again, I'm talking about experimentation with people by people 7,000 years ago. What they could do is they could pick seeds from plants that produce the taste they wanted, the size they wanted, the plant that grew pretty good in the environment they were in with the rain, with the type of soil they were in. So that pretty soon the teosinte became maize as it was specialized by these people because of its taste, its size, and, it, and the possibility that it could be grown year in and year out. Okay? Maize uh, uh, became easy to grow. It was highly adaptable and could be uh, uh, turned into a hybrid fairly easily. And in many, many places, it could be a second crop so that one crop could be grown and maize could follow all in the same growing season. By the time first people inhabited all of the continents of the New World, maize could be found in Canada. It could be found down to Chile and everywhere in between. Now, in some places, as we'll discover it a little bit uh, later as we visit Cahokia, in some places, the maize had to be brought in, okay? Had to be brought from, from a little bit warmer part of, of the continent. But it could be found in the diets of first people from Canada all the way down to Chile. Now, you probably remember that civilization depend on agriculture. If a group of people do not have agriculture, it's very, very hard for them to grow civilization. Now I'm meaning, I'm meaning uh, uh, back a few years. Today, I guess we, can, we could put a, a group of people almost anywhere, send them everything that, that we grow and plant and all the rest of that, and they could probably begin uh, to become civilized. But with the first people, in order for them to stop and settle, that's a key word there, with, with civilization is settlement. To settle, they had to have agriculture. And maize is probably the main reason why they could settle. And without or, or with maize, you could have the beginning of civilization as we, as we call it today. Now, in Central America, probably uh, uh, in Mexico and Central America, Mesoamerica, 
the, the, the grandfather, grandmother of all the civilizations, that's the, the Aztecs and the, and the Mayan and, and all of those, were the Olmec people, okay? About 4,000 years ago, they began to flourish in Central America and in uh, uh, the South of Mexico, primarily because they learned how to really put maize to work. They developed huge maize crops and fields around the places that they, were, that they were settling in, and their settlements began to grow. The three sisters plus deer as, as a meat source and domesticated dog, that's not very nice to talk about, but that was part of the, the meat supply, okay? Those, those crops and animals allowed the beginning of places like we see in the picture on the right, this is a picture of San uh, Lorenzo. San Lorenzo in, in Central America is one of the first urban centers in, in the New World. And there's a couple of things in there that are really fascinating to look at. This city, and, and you say, well, yeah, it's pretty small. No, what we're looking at is the center of the city. We're looking at a pyramid, right? which we're gonna see lots of in more pictures. We see a structure up on the top of the pyramid. We see a big green field. We see buildings down here towards the bottom of the picture. Looks like with the walls, of course, have been broken down. Looks like they could be rooms. Well, that's exactly what they were. San uh, Lorenzo was the center of an urban area in those trees that you can see in the background of the pyramid and that would actually encompass this entire green field. In those trees are hundreds of workers and family huts and houses, okay? This city that we're seeing was the beginning of uh, a civilization that prized and developed some things that are, that are firsts in the new world. First of all, after 3 million cubic yards of rock were moved away by a society that had no wheel. They had not developed a wheel yet. So they had to carry 3 million cubic yards of rock away from this site that we're looking at by basket and dump it away. So they could have this great center to their city and they, and they could have this pyramid and the other housing that's around it. Well, the uh, agriculture that was growing, that was, that, was, that was the base for this city and this culture led to all kinds of wonderful things. Number one, the agriculture let the people stop long enough to consider their origins. Where did they come from? Where will they go at the end of their life? Are there deities? Are there, are there beings uh, more powerful than humans, they began to consider religious ideas. They began to develop art. They developed simple vases. They developed mural work. They had time to do that with agriculture. They had time to do that because a group of people were now settled together, exchanging ideas. Some of the art was in the form of these giant heads that you see one up in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. That's about 11 feet tall, okay, carved out of, I believe that one's out of basalt. About 17 of them are really known uh, to be around. Some others could still be hidden in the jungle areas around that area. But the agriculture allowed this artwork to develop and allowed this, these religious thoughts to develop, okay. It also it began uh, to uh, uh, convince people that they needed to understand more about nature, especially when to plant and when to harvest. And so the agriculture began to uh, help these people consider nature around them as patterns, seasons, months, time of day. And with that became the beginning of astronomy for these people uh, uh, in the Olmec uh, civilization. 
And lastly, we, we know we talked about the three sisters, maize and beans and squash and, and deer and so forth, but they also, the omic, found another plant growing in the environment that after experimentation, uh, after experimentation, they found could produce an elastic kind of material, a material that formed into a ball could become quite a crazy sport. The omic are given the uh, 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 pat on the back or, or whatever for the development of a game involving a rubber ball for probably the first time in civilization. Okay, they played it on a, on a court with a stone wall, bouncing the ball back and forth. Now the ball went sometimes up as heavy as four pounds. So it's not like a beach ball being bounced around. It was a pretty heavy uh, 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 toy or game. The Olmec also used rubber to waterproof by uh, putting a layer of it on clothing, put a, putting a layer of it on, on uh, uh, tools and so forth to keep them uh, safe from uh, water. Now we're talking about all of this well before Europeans ever came to this country. Okay. This is probably 4,000 years ago here in the Americas. Now, let's consider control over nature a little bit further because this is an amazing group of people that we're gonna look at next. About 7,000 years ago in Bolivia, in a place called the Beni Savannas, a group, a group of people uh, took root there and said, this is a place where we can live because we can plant crops, we can capture animals, we can domesticate animals, we can build good housing for ourselves. So 7,000 years ago, these people settled on the Beni Savannah in Bolivia. Okay, that's way up at the Northern end of South America. Now, we don't have to walk there because fortunately we found this airplane that we're looking out of. This photo that's on the right is of the Beni Peninsula, the Beni Savannah today, out of the a window of an airplane. And I want you to consider control over nature and see what these people could do to master their natural environment 7,000 years ago, okay? When you look out the window, what you see you see a not, lot of nice green grassland, right? You see a bunch of trees on mounds. What we're looking at right now is the Beni Savannah in the middle of summer. But if you were to back up just a couple of months, all of that nice lush grassland would be underwater. Why? Because the Beni is in part the headwater of the Amazon River. So on the eastern side of the Andes Mountains, melting snow, extensive rainfall, create that, that, that wet, swampy, flooded area that eventually drains down and becomes the mighty Amazon River. Well, here come these, these uh, first people they get to this area and they say, well, wait a minute, I, I think maybe we can do something about this. Okay, so what did they do? Well, first thing they did is they started moving soil and rock around so that these areas with trees on them that you can see, these are raised platforms. They're connected with raised walkways built out of dirt, rock, whatever a material, uh, uh, a wood that could be found in the area. The green that's down there that you see, these are cleared fields, cleared by uh, uh, burning in the fall. Because the Beni people are going to be uh, agricultural people. They're gonna plant. So they need to have uh, an area where they can plant. So in the fall, when the crops have all gone yellow, everything's been picked those crops are burned in preparation for the 
for the late winter and spring, when the rains will come in, that'll be washed away. The new soil uh, will be uh, run down from the mountains. The nitrogen from that rainfall will, will uh, uh, fill the soil again with nitrogen. And this green field will be grass ready for the planting that the many people will want to put in it, okay? Well, of course, what do you think they planted? They planted the three sisters because that, you remember, were being planted all over the place, okay? Uh, they planted it on those green fields right there. Those green fields, even in the hot summer, would be wet from canals that were drug, uh, or dug by these many people. The three sisters would have plenty of water. They would have, uh, the manioc plants would have plenty of good soil to grow in. And now a, a, a crop called peanuts could be grown in this area. Eventually, look at this, eventually, one million people would walk this savanna and live in this area that was flooded for uh, three months a year by the mighty Amazon River. I would say that's pretty good control of the environment, but that's not all, just burning, building causeway, waiting for the water to recede. That's not all. Let's look a little bit further. Here are the Beni, uh, a couple of drawings regarding the Beni people, again, about 7,000 years ago. On the left-hand side, this is very complicated drawing. It's gonna be hard to see. But what I want you to imagine in this photo, uh, in this drawing with me is this. There are a group of people, the Amazon River, uh, the headwaters, are being filled by the rains and the melt-off from the Andes Mountains, the, uh, running down the side of the mountain. The fields are covered with water. This is all connected to the Amazon River. It's like the Amazon River is all the way up to there. What lives in the Amazon River? Well, by golly, fish do. So what these people figured out was this. Look, the Amazon River backs up all the way to our savanna. And look in the water. There are fish. And you can eat those little critters. Well, what can we do? How about if we develop fish traps? They're called fish weirs. And in our picture, uh, if you can see the red arrow pointing back away, that arrow points back to a stone structure. As the water filled this area and the fish were in the water, brought up into the savanna area, some of the water and fish entered into these stone structures because they were completely closed. The water flowed over the top of them and filled them. Eventually, as the water receded, the Bene people would empty out these, these weirs, these traps, slowly letting the water run out, but leaving what behind inside the trap? eating fish. When the water was low enough, they weighed into the fish trap, picked the fish up, and they had uh, uh, some awfully nice uh, additions to their food supply, especially when they learned how to dry the fish and keep them for a little bit longer. Some of the other people on the Bendy used some nets to capture fish as the, as the river ran back down towards the mouth of the Amazon. What they made those nets out of, you're gonna learn about in just a few minutes. In the right-hand picture, the drawing over here, is we see the middle of the springtime when the crops are being planted. And lo and behold, look at all those people putting, putting maize in the ground, maize seeds. But if you look up the side of those hills, you see those structures. Those are the homes that Benny learned how to build up on the raised uh, earth area. Those were out of the water when, when the Amazon backed up during the springtime to fill the savanna with water. And the people who walked between the buildings on the causeways up there were fine. They had their food supply all stored away. They were good to go. But that's what life looked like during the summertime. 
left picture, the drawings, what life looked like in the springtime as the fish were being harvested. Now, this is 7,000 years ago. I say these people were doing a pretty good job in controlling the natural environment. Well, one more shot at natural environment before we move on to another question. We're uh, going to go into the country of Peru right now. Peru is over on the western side of South America. You know that it borders on the Pacific Ocean, and it has a very interesting coastline on its western side. You can see it in the picture. You'll see in the middle, uh, against the beautiful blue sky, you'll see some mountains with snow on top. Those are Andes Mountains, part of the Andes chain. You see right in front of you marshland. And what you can't see, obviously, because it's a photograph, is what's right behind you. And that's a sandy beach, because the ocean is just behind you. OK, well, this is an interesting set of natural uh, conditions that we have to do something with if we want to use this land. And here's what we face. Along about springtime, as these mountains start to melt the snow, where does that snow go as water? It runs down these mountains on this side, the western side of the Andes. It runs down into this marshland and it runs out into the Pacific Ocean. It runs out in about in 50, it's about 57 river valleys down from the mountains, through the marshland and into the Pacific. Okay, well, I think that I could grow some nice maize crop down here with this nice water, but how do I control the flooding? How do I do something where it doesn't dry out so bad that it's like the sandy beach behind me. All right, let's go ahead and start controlling the flooding by doing tributaries off of these rivers that will flood additional soil areas. Areas with pretty, pretty fertile soil. So we'll run water off of those raging rivers through small canals into areas like this where they can soak, bring nitrogen to the soil, get the soil nice and ready for what crop the three sisters, okay? Besides that, behind us, we have the ocean. Well, can't we, can't we farm the ocean in some way? Sure we can. Shellfish, great to eat. How do we get them? How do we grab any? Well, I'll tell you what, we have an interesting little plant that we have found in this area that if you, if you pull the pods off the plant, you take the fibers out of the pods, guess what you're working with? You're working with a, a, a very early uh, form of the cotton pl uh, plant. So these people on the western coast of Peru were growing uh, the Three Sisters. They were going into the ocean with nets that they were making out of the cotton, natural cotton plant that was in their area. They were eating the three sisters, okay? But they also developed another idea. And this is, this is part of the Inca genius uh, uh, of that civilization. Why not exchange the goods from down here on the seacoast up the side of those mountains to the people living up there in the mountains? up to Cusco and cities like that, Lima, okay? Well, we call that vertical exchange. The people on the seacoast within the Inca system of land management were required after they got their food supply to move their uh, 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 corn, beans and squash and cotton and fish up the mountain to the people up there who would exchange it for potatoes, tomatoes, wool from alpaca, and anything else, avocado, uh, not avocado, but uh, 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 spices, peppers that were grown on the mountain side, but were not available down here on the seacoast. Vertical exchange being practiced uh, five, 6,000 years ago. Pretty outstanding.
Okay, now there was a question we had on our list. We said, well, you know, these, these first people, uh, indigenous people, Native Americans, yeah, okay, so they, you know, they planted some nice crops, they, they could eat, felt good about that. But what about cities? Real civilizations have real cities. Do we know of any cities that grew up in the Americas uh, as a product of, of the uh, industry of the first people? You bet we do. Okay, now the picture you have on the left is of a place called Cusco in the Peru and Peruvian Andes. Uh, Cusco was the capital of the Inca Empire between uh, before 1532 or thereabouts when the Spanish arrived and there was that horrendous episode of the Inca Emperor uh, Atahualpa being held for ransom. Remember that. The Spanish wanted three rooms full of gold and silver well, because once they got to this area, they saw some of the temples lined with gold and silver trimming and everything. They wanted three rooms for, we'll return your leader if you give us the gold and silver. Well, they got the gold and silver and they murdered the leader. So um, that, that, uh, that was a horrendous episode in the life of the Inca people. But let's look at this. Uh, the Inca empire, as we said before, was a, was a uh, very tightly managed and controlled empire. The chief or, or, or the primary Inca, and there were, there were a number of Incas because the empire was divided into some sections and each section had its own Inca. Uh, each of those Incas lived or had a palace in Cusco. You can see one of them as a, as a big pillared building right here in the front of your picture in the bottom right-hand corner, okay? Uh, and, um, so it was a governmental seat, uh, a center. But there were some other fascinating things about nature as well as cities. You can't very well have a city without control of nature. The city has to have a purpose, okay? And it also must control, to some extent, the environment around. It. Now, look at the picture. Do you see those steps? You know, this is a pretty huge set of mountains right in front of you, right? And you can see the city down at the bottom in this little valley. But look at these steps that run down the side of this mountain. So what's going on there? Well, first of all, when snow is melted, we don't want that gushing water to be running down the side of that mountain. So we create those steps to create a break in the flow and control the water, the excess water being run on the outside of those steps. And what's on the inside of those steps? Soil. Yeah, soil. Those steps are filled so that plants can be grown there and this city can have a food supply. Not only food from down there on the seacoast that will come up in exchange for plant uh, food that will go down, but they will have their own food supply. So plants will be grown on all of those steps and those rocks that are holding the soil in place all summer long into the fall, even into the winter, are going to absorb sunlight so that they stay warm. And what do they do in turn? They warm the soil that they're holding back. Now, what you can't see, but is also one of the success features of the city uh, of Cusco, two major rivers ran right through the area where Cusco was being built. And they were, would not allow the city to be built the way the Inca wanted it to be built. And so what did the Inca do? They read, they read directional, no, I don't say that. They changed the direction of the two rivers. So they ran away from the populated areas, but were still accessible to the people as a water supply. Not bad set success features for a city. So we have a pretty good sized city at the center of the Inca Empire, uh, 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 developing all the way up into uh, the 1530s by the Inca. Okay, there are some other things in, in this city of Cusco that are going to blow your socks off. Let's take a little trip up above the city to uh, uh, the top of a little mountain. This is a place that's called Saxe Huana. 
It's a citadel. It's a fort. It uh, had some temple uh, 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 parts to it. But take a look at this. These are three long walls of stones. Can you see them? They stretch from left to right in your picture. Okay. Way in the upper left hand corner of your picture is the city of Cusco that we were just in. We were just down there. But this is a, a photograph, so this is mine. Uh, uh, but that's the city down there. Here's Se Huacamana, uh, uh, Se Sac Huaman, the citadel up above the city. What is this thing all about? Well, it was to be a protective device, a place where the Inca could rally their forces and fight off uh, invaders. Okay? But that's not the most interesting feature of this mystery that is attached with this, with this citadel. It's actually also the name of the town that's up on this mountain too. Here's the mystery. Oh, well, wait a minute, that looks like a bunch of stone. Yep, that's exactly what it is. But in the early days of the Inca, <clears throat> they developed a technology that is until this day yet to be mastered, okay? Look at those stones. That's one of the walls of this, this citadel that we just looked at. That's one of the walls. What is interesting about it? Look at the joints between the stones, okay? Some of these stones towards the bottom of your picture weigh 100 tons. Right? How in the world did the Inca make these stones shape the way they could so that when they were laid together, no mortar holding them together, they stayed together by just fitting this well. Okay, That fits so tightly that you cannot pass a piece of paper between those stones. Some of them 100 tons in size. Now, what did the Incas have to use to work on these stones? How about iron tools? Okay, and arm or hand power, human power. Nobody has yet figured out how this is done. And besides that, a considerable number of these stones, and it's very hard to see. On, on this, but they have they have bubbles. Apparently, it, it, they're bubbles like the size of hand grips from the sides of these stones that were apparently fashioned by the stonemason so that they could maybe be handled by the stone handlers. How do you how do you get that? How do you form that out of rock like that? You have iron tools and you have corrosive, uh, cor uh, 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 you have a material that you can sand by rubbing onto the stone to make the surface as smoother and so forth. But that's all you've got, you have no machinery. Take another look at the city this way. There's the city on the left-hand side. You notice the tops of these walls, a lot of the stones are gone, why? Because when the Spanish took over the city of Cusco, they went up to the citadel and they said, those are great. We're going to use those stones up there, not for their silly citadel. We're going to take them down into the right-hand picture, the city of Cusco. And when we start building our own building in their city, our city now, we're going to make the foundations out of the stones from the citadel. So you see the stones over there on the right. I want you to notice, too, that none of those joints between those stones are anywhere near as good as they were when they were up in the Citadel. That technology has never been uh, uh, mastered except by the most modern tool. All right, let's run through a couple of other cities. Okay. This is a city um, about 200 miles uh, from Cusco. As you go down from the mountains of Cusco, you go down to the seacoast again. This was the largest city in the Americas before the Spanish arrived. 
okay? And it has a beach location. It's an Inca city. It's Caral. It has a significant population, about 3,000 buildings for people to live into. Uh, in the city center itself, and about 20,000 more buildings around the outskirts of the city. The mountains in this picture, uh, in this drawing, are in the background. Then you have the city. Now, this is the coast, the Pacific coast of Peru. So behind you, maybe 100 feet, is the Pacific Ocean. This city was a gover governmental city for the Inca on the coastline of Peru. It was also a resort city. People came to here from the upper classes of, of the Inca society to, uh, to bathe, to go to concerts, to play games, and to relax. Okay, not bad, not bad for a city. The uh, Inca land system uh, that we talked about, I think we may have mentioned before, the, uh, the, the chief Inca and, and the four uh, helper Incas, I guess we could call them, divided up all of the land of the Inca empire and doled it out to the people. And the people then had to follow the orders of the Inca. But most often, that meant some kind of reciprocity. If you gave a, a, a maize and sell, shellfish and, and, and those went up the mountain or went to the next village, you could expect to get something in return that would cover that loss for you. And so the Inca land system uh, was one of the reasons why this city was built over here. This, system, this city, uh, like we said before, the largest in the Americas before the Spanish arrived, was built on barter, there was no money, and built on the system of land uh, use engineered by the Inca that made sure all of the, all of the land was used uh, to its maximum efficiency. All right, a couple more cities. Teotihuacan. Uh, Boy, that, this one always, always uh, throws me. It's in Central America. And I want to show you this one, not only because it's large and it's full of stone and it's got uh, this avenue of the dead down the middle of, uh, of about a mile and a half long road between two pyramids and all of, but, but look, I want you to think for a second about the shapes of these structures. Go back to the pyramid for a moment. The pyramids are found all over Egypt or throughout much of uh, 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 Northern Egypt. They're found in a number of other places into India, and, and, but especially in South America and Central America. What's their purpose? Well, it kind of depends on the, the people who are using it. But first of all, just structurally, it was a much easier form of tall building to build than something that would be square or rectangle or something we'd be uh, uh, used to seeing today that had steel girders inside of it and all that type of thing. These things were built at piles of earth, piles of rock, piles of stone. And so a big wide base sloping towards the top meant it was structurally stable, okay? Why would that be important? Well, the pyramid had a couple of other uses also. First of all, its shape, uh, you might recall from, from looking into the pyramids in Egypt, uh, was supposedly uh, to replicate a sun's ray coming back down to the planet Earth from the sun god. And it meant that if you followed the ray back upward, uh, especially if you were a, in the noble class, the nobility, and you had died, your pathway back to the god went up the sun ray. And up the side of the pyramid was much easier than climbing up the side of a mountain or up a cliff or anything like that. As you can see, these people on the right-hand side with the steps there, that climb would be much easier for those people who are saddened by the loss of someone in the nobility and the body might be taken up to the top of the pyramid for some period of time. 
Human sacrifice is usually or often practiced on the tops of these uh, pyramids also, uh, because again, it was a, a sacrifice to the gods and it went right back up the ray of sun. Uh, often these uh, pyramids had a glossy kind of stone finish on them so that the sun's rays would, would reflect off of them. Uh, there are a number of smaller pyramid shapes in the left-hand picture. Uh, and you can see that there's sort of series of big steps up to a structure at the top. These are either civic buildings, homes on top for the wealthy, or some kind of religious purpose. If it was up on a pyramid, it was royalty or it was holy. Okay. You and I, no, I don't say you and I, I would certainly be living in one of the small huts that if you have eagle vision, you could see in this picture on the left are scattered throughout the countryside. I would not be up on the top of the tree. Now I'd like to go to Tenochtitlan, which uh, the name might be familiar to. You're talking about big cities in the Americas. You bet we've got some. How about if we went up to the site of Mexico City? Now, the last city we just visited with the pyramids and the Avenue of the Dead, that's about 25 miles away from Mexico City. Where we're looking at right now, Tenochtitlan, is Mexico City, the original Mexico City in the Aztec Empire, Montezuma's home. Okay? Now, I want you to take a look at the city. You see the center of the city. You see the biggest building. Well, that is Montezuma's palace. 100 rooms in that palace. Each has its own bathroom, by the way, which is, I think, an interesting feature. You move down, you have the royalty scattered around Montezuma. You go down further and further. You can see maybe the white adobe houses. Those are well-to-do people, but they're not in the nobility yet. The regular folks are living outside the wall in all of this landscape around the outside because you see this city is built on an island. And throughout the city, we can only see a suggestion of it on the upper left, canals from the Lake uh, uh, Tecoco have been allowed to flow into the city. So people not only moved along the three major thoroughfares of the city and the side streets, but they can also go by water up and down certain portions of the city. There were gates that allowed river traffic to come into the city. You can see it in the upper left-hand side. In the middle of the city, uh, a couple of botanical gardens, a couple of zoos, uh, uh, all kinds of floating gardens could be found in the center of the city. Not a bad city for 3,500 years ago. And then this is a special one I'm going to mention very quickly, Cahokia, which by the way, when Cahokia was in its prime, it was as big as London. Cahokia is down at the southern tip of Illinois, where the Mississippi, the Illinois, and the Ohio pretty much come together. It has immense cornfields around it or had, because this was, this was about um, uh, a city of a, about 120 mounds, 18,000 people, as big as London, as I said. And again, it, 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 millions of cubic feet of uh, earth had to be moved to make these mounds. You can still walk these mounds. They don't have the dwellings on them. The wooden stockade fence that you can see around the whole edge of the bottom of the picture is now gone, okay? But this city grew because of the corn crop. It could supply corn all the way up to the Gulf of Mexico, uh, down to the Gulf of Mexico. It could supply corn all the way out to the Atlantic coast, up to the Great Lake because of its river location. It was the premier city in North America until probably a corn blight hit. When the cornfields were destroyed by the blight, as we said, without agriculture, 
you probably don't have the roots of a city and Cahokia disappeared. But you can still walk it, climb the mounds. I've done that. I've sent my kids there uh, at their uh, archaeological dig sites there. They take students. Marvelous experience. All right. We're going to finish up this way. If all of this wonderful stuff is going on in the new world and, and being done by the first people, why could Europeans take over after 1492 so easily? Well, we know uh, the, the horse and the gun had a lot to do with it. But one thing we don't uh, usually think about is Europeans, because of their years and years of conflict, leading up to the time of the, of the uh, uh, Spanish and the uh, uh, English coming to the, to the New World, were quite well versed in diplomacy. But remember, they were marrying off their kids to kids on the other side of the English Channel and all that to, in order to make uh, alliances and all that sort of stuff. Well, when they came to the Americas, they began to play one group of uh, uh, first people or Native Americans by this time, off against another, until they could uh, uh, develop the upper hand. That happened in the Incas with the Incas. It happened with the Aztecs, uh, and all of that, uh, uh, all of that kind of stuff was taking place. But other things were in play also, and the most important one we're going to get to here in just a second: population. Uh, uh, how come when English settlers got to the Americas in the early 1500s, there was only a fraction of the, uh, of the first people population that we know existed. Where had those people gone? What had happened to them? One English writer in a journal uh, had made a couple of trips to the Americas and by the last one, he said he, said he couldn't believe it. All of his previous trips he had gone up and down the New England coastline, the Atlantic coastline, and there was dense smoke from the Indian villages. There were just bonfires, there were fires, and, and there were all kinds of cooking going on, and all kinds of uh, things going on, lots of campfires. Now, the last time he went up and down the coast, there was no smoke. Where had the smoke gone? In other words, where had the people gone? In fact, the first 50 English settlements along the Atlantic coast were actually established on the sites of old Indian villages where the Indians were gone for some reason. Well, as you probably know, here's the reason. As English settlers and, 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 and the French, uh, uh, well, actually the Spanish probably better than, than the French settlers up as far north as they, they came in. But most of the English settlers talked about the fact that they could find, still find piles of skeletons where the uh, uh, indigenous people had built their villages. Why, what was going on here? Well, the indigenous people, the first people, when their uh, members of their family or their village got sick, they stayed with them, okay? Uh, they took the viruses from those sick people with them when they eventually moved on, very much like the COVID uh, uh, virus. This is called a uh, virgin soil epidemic. The first people, the indigenous people in the Americas had no special immunity. In fact, not having lived in Europe, they didn't even have the kinds of immunities that would be passed on from generation to generation. So indeed, the, the, the people of the Americas were virgin soil when it came time for epidemic. The estimates today are, about, are that about 90% of the uh, indigenous population of the Americas died from diseases. Uh, throughout the Americas, diseases brought by European settlement. That means that in the Americas, about 55 million first people died from disease. 
let's stop for a second and think of what we've just gone through. There's a, there's a good little book I'm going to show you on the next screen, the last screen, that talks about the Columbian Exchange. When Europeans got here, what did they find? What could they take back to Europe with them? Left-hand side of the page. They could bring corn back. Corn was basic, was, was unknown in Europe before it was brought from the New World. Potatoes could be brought back. Tomatoes could be brought back. Uh, the cassava plant, tobacco for, for medicinal purposes. Uh, uh, Native Americans smoked that, smoked tobacco and pipe for what is believed to be medicinal purposes, not social purposes. Okay, the uh, Americas gave to Europe tons upon tons of silver and gold, much of which went through Europe on to China, where it was exchanged for the goods in, in the uh, Orient, okay? Um, I'm gonna leave the last one go, syphilis, uh, because it's kind of a neat exchange going on there. Let's go to the right-hand side. Uh, what did it, Europeans bring to the Americans? Well, uh, sugarcane that was planted in the Canary Islands, uh, from the Canary Islands. Uh, coffee from Turkey, from Africa, was brought to the Americas. Rice, which was the equivalent to uh, corn in our in, in the Western Hemisphere, the rice was that in the uh, in uh, Europe. Uh, chickens, pigs, horses, sheep, donkeys, all brought to the New World by the Europeans. Christianity was brought to the New World. So was the importation of African slaves. You got to remember that many of the Europeans who came to the New World expected after they saw the native population that the native population would be very good workers on plantations in the New World as soon as the Europeans could get those plantations established. Sugar cane, uh, eventually cotton very quickly, coffee, things of that nature. When so many of the Native Americans, indigenous population died off, there weren't enough people to put a plantation system into operation. And so that was probably the biggest reason why Europeans looked to the African coast and the enslavement of Africans to be brought to the New World because of the death of, uh, of Native Americans. From what? Let's look down here. Smallpox measles, the plague, typhus, any disease that had uh, rampaged Europe at any time that was still being carried by any European coming to, this, to the new world, once it got here, it was on virgin soil. Okay. Uh, I do remember reading in one of the, uh, uh, in one history book, uh, the only disease that went back to Europe went back via Columbus's crew because they uh, uh, had a lot of hanky-panky with uh, Native American women. And apparently syphilis uh, was a disease in the New World that uh, had not been encountered yet in the Old World. And so when Columbus's crew went back to Europe, about five years after they arrived back, we have the first reported case of syphilis in, in European history. And so that's called the Columbian Exchange. And I'm gonna tell you about a very good book here uh, right now, if you wanna follow up on that exchange and, and how one thing led to the other in that exchange. Indian Givers, uh, the book on the left hand side, uh, how the Indians of the Americas transformed the world uh, Jack Waterford's book, excellent, excellent, a good read, fast read by a historian. The one on the right-hand side is 1491, you notice one year before Columbus, uh, 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 done by uh, 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 Chuck uh, Mann. I'm just trying to get my screen set up here. Uh, Chuck Mann is a journalist, and that is an extensive book. It is on, uh, in the, uh, Library for the Blind, 
You can get an audio copy of it. It's a long book. It's about a 16 hour read. But it has just got the most wonderful detail about all of these stories that we just talked about. So when we talk about uh, the impact uh, of the first people on the environment of, of uh, the Americas and how they carved out a living for themselves, the advances that they, that they uh, spearheaded and so forth, I shook my head some years ago when I got interested in digging deeper into the uh, first people, how in the world that never got more play in our history books. And I'm, I'm loving what Catherine said at the start, we're just concluding November as the Indigenous People Month. And I hope that really catches traction and we learn a lot more about these wonderful people that came to visit and settle in the Americas before all the Europeans arrived. And with that, I'd like to say thank you again. And I'm going to uh, ask if there are any questions. I'll be happy to try to give an uh, answer to Thanks very much, Bill. So we've got about um, we've got about eight minutes for questions. So does anybody have a question? You can raise your hand um, on using Zoom or on video or send a chat. Hey, Catherine, it looks like we've got a question from Scuffy Mosley. So I'm going to go ahead and allow them to talk. Can you hear me now? Um, my question is, how do you think that current day schools and curriculum can set this right and actually teach students now this in context so it's not something that people learn after their formal education? I'll tell you, uh, uh, let's, let's form a partnership and the two of us will go out and set the course on that revision. And we will become very, very wealthy and we will be very well known. <laughs> okay. But look, you know what? Um, I, I sent something in, in the way you said uh, that question. I, I, I love it. You know what? Uh, we can guarantee that not much will change if we just write that down in a curriculum guide. We can guarantee that not much is going to change if we just add three more pages to the history book that has 850 pages in it already. That's not, uh, that's not the way to encounter history. I know we have to cover stuff in our curriculum and in our textbooks. But one of the things I tried to do for the last 20 years of my career was to try to show teachers how to put real world problems into their curriculum and turn the kids loose as problem solvers where they could uh, uh, go ahead and uh, put together their own inquiry, their own investigation, and then bring it back to the class and share what they found. So if, if we were going to do something like this, I would say this, let's, let's go ahead and build a couple of problems. For example, you're an you're a, a English sea captain. You have a crew of Europeans you're about to put on this brand new coastline of the Americas. Uh, they, brought, they brought a few things along, but what, 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 how are we gonna prepare this group of people for starting a new life in the Americas? What would you write in your instructions to these people? And then say, all right, kids, so, so if you had to do that, what in the world, how would you prepare people for life in the Americas? And as the kids would dig and see this, this kind of stuff that we were talking about today, they would say, all right, we're gonna tell people about uh, uh, the culture. We're gonna tell people about the nobility of some of these. We're gonna tell people about, and what are we gonna bring from European? That way the kids would discover what in the world was going on in the new world and a much more exciting format 
than listening to me tell them about it uh, in front from, from the front of the classroom. That's the way we need to do more history. Unfortunately, we can't make the history period six hours long every day in school where we could do more of that. So I would like to see some of these good books like these right here in front of us uh, be written. I'd like to see better movies being produced. I'd like to see better Netflix series being produced that, that tell stories about first people that uh, are much more realistic and stretch a lot further than the stuff that we're, we're showing the public nowadays. So I guess that's the way I go about it. Kind of not as always in the most formal way, but a way that I'd love to you know, see have some impact. Great question. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Uh, another question. Is anyone still there? I just wanted to chime in. If anyone has questions, not only can you raise your hand, you can also type them in the chat box. Okay, we got a question from Luann K. I'm gonna go ahead and let her ask her question. Well, and if you could un unmute yourself. There okay. we go. Thank you. I'm not used to that format, this format. Um, I very much enjoy reading books that are fiction, but based in truth and history. I like books by, for instance, the author Alexander Tom. I don't know if you're familiar with him about Native American peoples. I was wondering if you have any other authors other than these two books that you've shown us that um, might be interesting that are historically based, but yeah. do you? Yes, I do. Hold on. You know what I'm going to do? This is very, very uncouth. My wife is at the bottom of the stairs coming up here to the office. I need to call out for her to help me with the name of uh, one particular author. Can you mind if I yell? Yeah. Hey, Abby. Yeah. The writer uh, that did the uh, uh, the Deadly Wake and so forth. Uh, Eric Larson. Oh no! Thank you so much. We had we we stumped ourselves over here. Here's an author that you've got to start listening uh, to, Eric Larson. Um. Oh. Let me let me give you an example. Uh, Eric Larson uses the historical event or events, the time period, and he writes it in his uh, uh, giving himself latitude to be a fiction writer as well as producing stories really uh, well versed in history. So, in the Deadly Wake, it is the story of the sinking of the Lusitania. Okay. But here's the way Larson deals with it. The first chapter, you are uh, taken aboard the Lusitania as it's preparing to sail. Excuse me, Bill. I'm sorry to interrupt, but we have just about one minute left. <laughs> okay. All right. Let me get, let me get. the Lusitania. You're, you're taken aboard. The captain is getting the crew ready. They're getting the, the guests on board and all that. Okay. Chapter two, Larson takes you aboard the submarine that sinks the Lusitania at the end of the book. In this chapter, the captain of the submarine is preparing the submarine for going out uh, 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 on its mission. He writes, about, he writes about Marconi bringing a wireless uh, 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 a telegraph to England and, and the use to, of it to capture a murder suspect. Uh, so, Try try him and uh, Eric Larson, and see what you think about uh, see what you think about him. Okay, oh, thank uh, you. Yeah, uh, I'm gonna yell down Abby, uh, Irish author. Delaney. Oh, uh, Frank Delaney, uh, uh, his book Ireland, weaving Irish traditional stories with Irish history, fantastic. 
Okay, I'm afraid it's, it's time to stop now, but thank you so much, Bill. This has been awesome. This is just All really right. fascinating. Good. I loved every minute of it and hope to see everybody uh, at another time. Okay, well, thanks. And um, so I just want to say we'd really like your feedback on today's program or any suggestions for future programs. So we'll be sending an email survey about this event soon. We wanna thank Bill for his great presentation, uh, Clint, Gina, and Sarah for all the things they did to help us. Um, and uh, Rebecca and the State Library Communications team and Matt and Clint for orchestrating the technology for today. Thank you.